Tonight, we're going to talk about why we should pray for the lost. And uh, tomorrow night, we're going to talk about how we can pray for the lost. And Thursday evening, we're going to speak on identifying with the lost. We've heard a lot about identifying with Christ. But uh, we haven't heard much about identifying with sinners, and uh, we're going to talk about that on Thursday. Before we get into the message tonight, I want to draw your attention to our table in the back. Uh, we've got several new of us. Leave a deposit of your spirit in our hearts. Father God, uh, uh, let, us, uh, let us know your heart tonight. And we thank you for all these things, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said, Amen. Turn to someone before you're seated and tell them you're in the right place tonight. Amen. Why we should pray for the lost. Why we should pray for the lost. Why should we pray for the lost? Well, number one, they really are lost. The world is without hope. And without God, they're away from God. They're separated from God. Uh, they are not headed for heaven. They will not go to heaven. There will not be some uh, divine uh, working in the last day where they automatically get in. Uh, folks, there is a lost and dying world out there. They are separated from God. And if something is not done... If there is not an intervention, if there is not intercession between the lost and God, they will go to hell. So we've got to know that, number one, the lost are really lost. And that includes those who don't believe. That includes those who do not know. The lost are really lost. And uh, we need to be aware of that as a church. We need to be aware of that uh, concerning our relatives and our family. If they're not saved, they will go to hell. If they're not saved, they are lost, separated from God. Uh, our acquaintances, our relatives, our friends, the people that we meet throughout the day, uh, anyone that you see without a born-again experience, without having Jesus born in their heart, without being born again of the incorruptible seed of the Word of God, they are lost. So number one, this is the number one reason we must pray for the lost because the, uh, the world is really lost. The second reason that we must pray is because no one else is going to. Amen. There are, uh, we think sometimes, well, there are special ministries of prayer, and, and certainly there are those that uh, have uh, heeded the call and gotten a hold of this idea that, uh, uh, that they must intercede. But... Uh, uh, we have got to pray because there isn't an alternative. The sinner, sinners are not going to pray for themselves. Uh, nominal Christians are not going to pray necessarily. Uh, you and I are required to pray. There is not a special ministry of intercession. God calls each believer to pray for the lost. In Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 16... It says, and he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. I want you to notice here, he wondered that there was no intercessor. God is looking for those who will pray. God is looking for those who will stand the gap. Amen? Praise God. So, Number one, the lost are really lost, and someone has to pray for them. Amen. Number two, we need to pray for the lost because no one else is going to do it. 
Thirdly, we need to pray for the lost um, because of their current situation. Because where the lost find them find themselves, they will not be saved. Let's say this. They will not be saved without prayer. Okay? Now that's a pretty strong statement. But uh, we're going to show you why they cannot be saved without prayer. The lost are really lost. They need prayer. The, uh, the lost um, have to be prayed for because of their current situation. What is their current situation? Number one, they're children of the devil. They're, under, they're in the devil's family. They're in the devil's fold. Jesus said of, uh, of the lost, he said in John 8 and verse 44, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you'll do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. So we've got to pray for the lost church uh, because they're in the devil's family. They're under the devil's power. They're under the devil's authority. And that's the next thing we see uh, uh, is uh, in Acts 26 and verse 17. Jesus spoke to the apostle Paul and said, I've called you to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. In other words, to turn them from the authority of Satan to God. Uh, the lost, we've got to understand this, that the lost are under the authority of the devil. They're under the power of the devil. Uh, they don't have a choice about being lost. They're lost because they're under the devil's power. You say they don't have a choice? If they could... If they had a choice, folks, if they understood there was a choice, they'd run to heaven. But the fact of the matter is, the lost are really lost. Uh, they are headed for hell. And uh, unless we pray, no one else is going to pray. Unless we pray and get them out from under the devil's authority, it's not going to get done. The, the third thing about the current situation of the lost is they are literally energized by the devil. You know, I just heard recently about a, a man who is an atheist who just did everything he could to cause, to wreak havoc in his family. I mean, just, just, uh, it was absurd the things, the lengths that he would go to, uh, to, uh, uh, to trouble his family. Why is that? Because the devil literally energizes the lost, and that's what Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2 tells us, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Uh, the spirit that now worketh, that word worketh, is energeo, which means the spirit that energizes the children of disobedience. So the lost are literally energized by Satan. If they give you problems, if they persecute you, if they trouble you, uh, don't be concerned about it. The reason for it is they are energized by Satan. The spirit that's working in them is, uh, is compelling them. It's, uh, it's moving them to work against you and work against the church, to work against even their own salvation. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind when you, uh, when you think about the lost. We think, well, they have a choice. No, they don't have a choice. The lost do not have a choice. They, ha they only have a choice when their eyes are open. But the fact of the matter is, if we go on, we understand their current situation is uh, they are children of the devil. They're in the devil's family. You know, you can watch another mother beat their child, and if they do it privately, if they do it uh, outside of the uh, forces of the law, uh, they'll continue to, uh, 
to be dominated by those parents. If a child is beaten, if a child is abused, and this is the case with the world. The world is in the devil's family. The world is under the devil's authority. The world is, is uh, energized by Satan. The Bible tells us in Mark 3.27 that no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. Well, who is the strong man? The strong man is Satan. How do we loose people from the strong man's house? There's only one way to do it, and that's through prayer. People can hear the gospel and hear the gospel and hear the gospel, but uh, if they don't get out from under the devil's bondage, if they're not loosed from the strong man's hold by your prayers and mine, then they'll remain bound. That's just a fact. What else? What other situation do, do the lost find themselves in? Well, according to Isaiah chapter 14, and uh, that chapter speaks of Lucifer and speaks of uh, his uh, character and his reign. It tells us in verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? We skip down to verse 17. He says, and he's describing Lucifer, describing the devil. He says, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the houses of his prisoners. In other words, the devil's not letting anybody out. The devil has a prison house, and the lost are bound in that prison house. Your family who's not saved are bound by the devil. Your friends who are not saved are bound by the devil. Your acquaintances, the clerk at the grocery store, the fellow that pumps your gas, the people that you see on a daily basis, if they are not saved, they are in a situation where they are in prison. Literally imprisoned by the devil, literally energized by Satan held by a strong man under the Satan's authority and literally in the devil's household, family of the devil, children of the devil. Not only are they prisoners of war, the Bible tells us in 1 John 5 and 19, it says, and we know that we're of God and that the whole world lieth in wickedness. That word lieth is very interesting. It means to do obeisance to. It means to lie prostrate before. So the world literally is doing obeisance, bowing before, lying prost prostrate before the enemy, before the devil, and they have no choice. They have no choice. You know, a friend of mine had a dream one time where he was on drugs. He was, a, he was a Christian, but he continued to flirt with, uh, with these substances. And the Lord showed him a dream. And in this dream, he saw these trees that were planted. And uh, the trees were just small. And as... Uh, as he watched them, in the dream, he, he took uh, whatever he was taking, cocaine, I believe it was, taking this drug, and uh, he'd get high, and he'd enjoy that high, and as he would, uh, when he was enjoying that high, it was like a hand would take him and push his head down. And then the next thing he knew is the hand released him, he looked up, and that tree that was small was now big. And there was another small tree. And he'd get high again. And this hand would take him and push him down. And hold him there for a while. And then when it let him up, this tree that was small was large. Now there's two large trees and there's another small tree growing. And this happened three or four times. 
when he woke, he understood that he was wasting his whole life. His whole life was passing him by as the world was, as others were maturing, as others were growing, he stayed in the same situation, stayed in the same place of bondage and the same place of growth. And if you know anybody, especially in the area of drugs and alcohol, uh, they don't mature. I mean, if a kid gets involved in drugs at 18 and he's involved till he's 30, once he gets off there, he starts right back up at 18. I mean, he's got that same level of maturity. He hasn't grown. He's, he's been taken up with all these, uh, uh, all these uh, things that would produce a, uh, some sort of a buzz in his life. Uh, but I'm telling you, folks, God calls us to be free. God calls us to mature. But if you give yourself over to sin, you give yourself over to the devil, you give yourself over to the devil's works, the devil's crowd, he's going to keep you bound. He's going to keep you in prison. He's going to make you. He will force you to lie prostrate before him. And literally, that's where the world is. Lying prostrate before the devil. Not only do they have a sin nature, but to the degree they give themselves to sin... The devil has more authority and more power in their life. You see, the devil doesn't have power to make everyone an alcoholic. It's only when you give yourself to that. The devil has no power to, to force everyone to take drugs. It's when you give yourself to that. And your family has given, yourself, uh, given themselves to that. You know, sin is passed on to the third and fourth generation. You know that, what that means? You as a father or a mother... If you allow your children to be involved in, in uh, if you allow yourself to be involved in sin, I don't care what it is, whatever kind of sin, that sin will impact your children. And it will impact your children's children. That's why you must stand up against bondage. Stand up against sin. Stand up against things that are contrary to the plan and will of God because it will impact not only your life, but it'll impact generations to come. And now, you know, sociologists say, well, you know, there, there must be a gene of alcoholism. And there, there's a, you know, a change in their system. Literally, there's, there's a gene. There's something that changes in the system of a child who's had parents who were alcoholics and grandparents who were alcoholics. And the sin is just passed on from one generation to another. And until someone stands up against the devil, someone stands up in righteousness and walks in the freedom that Jesus has for them, they'll remain bound, their children will remain bound, and others after them will remain, remain bound. And the only way out of that prison house, the only way out of doing obeisance to the devil is to stand up in the authority of God and resist the devil and pray God's will and pray God's plan into your life and into the life of your family. But uh, this is where the world finds themselves. Children of the devil, in the family of the devil. You know, how many times I've looked at other family and children in other family and, you know, you just, you can't blame them. You can't blame these little kids why they act the way they act because their parents act just like them. Amen? I mean, you gotta, I've seen some ornery stinkers out there, just little five-year-olds, you know, and you think, well, you know, you just like to slap them up across the head, you know, they're just so rude and so, uh, but, but you really can't blame a five-year-old. What's wrong with them? What's wrong with them is they got parents that are idiots, they got parents that are just moving down the wrong road that, that have provided the wrong example and the wrong, uh, uh, the wrong motivations. So, uh, you know, your heart goes out to them. And so this is how we have to understand the world. You know, we think, you know, why is it the church filled with, with people? It's because they're bound. Their father won't allow them to come to church. Did you hear me? I said they're in the wrong family and their daddy won't let them come to church. Because they start fooling around a slippery creek bank, eventually they'll slip in. 
sinners are in the household of evil. They're in the household of the devil. And I don't care how good a person is. I don't care how moral he is. I don't care how, uh, uh, how upstanding of a citizen he is in society. If he has not been born again by the incorruptible seed of the word of God, he's in the devil's household. He takes on the nature of Satan. And when this life is over, he will split hell wide open. Why should we pray? Because they're under the devil's authority. They're energized by Satan. They're bound by Satan in the strong man's house. Literally held prisoner by the devil. Literally doing prostrate, uh, doing obeisance and lying prostrate before him. The whole world lieth. The whole world lieth prostrate before the devil. Well, if that wasn't enough, the current situation that the lost find themselves in and, and the reason we need to pray for them is the lost are blinded. Think about it, folks. If you knew you were headed for disaster, if you knew, really knew you were headed for hell, you'd make an about face as quickly as you possibly could before it was too late. But they're going merrily on their way, headed for hell with no one stopping them. Why? Because they're blind. The Bible says this, that if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4. The lost are literally blind. They cannot see. They do not know where they're headed. It's a tragic situation. So what has to happen? Some, someone has to turn the light on. Someone has to take the blinders off. Now listen, let me say something about blinders. It's not enough for them just to hear the gospel. Listen to me closely. It is not enough for them to hear the gospel. They can hear it and hear it and hear it and still be blind to it. Are you listening to me? They can hear it. It's on the airwaves. It's on the radios. It's on the television. There's a church on every street corner. The gospel is going forth and they've heard it, yet they've not responded. They've heard it, yet the word has not had its impact. Why? Because there's something about prayer that makes a way for people. There's something about prayer that uh, sets a man free, that takes him out of that family so he can see what's going on. If all you ever knew, if all you ever were, you were locked in a, in a basement someplace, and fed scraps from somebody's table, and you were beaten three times a day, and that's all you ever knew, you wouldn't know to escape. You wouldn't know to do anything different. Someone, some, somehow, someone opens a door, and you walk up out of the basement, and you understand there's a whole world that's available to you. There's a whole new world. Well, what's happened? Someone's, someone's turned the light on. Someone's made something available to you that wasn't available to you before. And that's what prayer does for the lost. Charles Spurgeon heard the gospel from the time he was in the cradle. He was read Bible stories and he went to church and he cut his teeth on the back of, uh, of church pews. And uh, he grew up in the church. But there came a day, one day, when the gospel was preached to him in power. And he literally heard it for the first time. He'd heard it thousands of times, but he never really heard it. This is what I'm talking about, being blind. So what's the answer? We've got to begin to pray for the lost. Who's going to pray if we don't? As I, uh, as I said, we've got to pray for the lost because no one else is going to do it. 
We need to pray for the lost because it's God's one, number one priority. Amen. It's God's number one priority. Look over in 1 Timothy chapter 2. The reason Jesus came in Luke 19 and verse 10. The Bible tells us that he came to seek and to save that which is lost. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, actually chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, I exhort therefore, I challenge you, I encourage you, uh, this is what I want you to do. That first of all, this is a priority with God, folks. First of all, supplications and prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for who? For all. You know, you talk about having a worldwide ministry. You can have a worldwide ministry through prayer. You can have a worldwide ministry if you'll just begin to do what God said. He wants us to pray for the nations. He wants us to pray for uh, our nation. He wants us to pray for our city. He wants to pray for our community. He wants you to pray for your acquaintances, the people that you meet. Because let me ask you a question. Who's going to pray for the people that you meet? Who's going to hand a gospel tract to them? Who's going to share the gospel to, uh, with them? Who's going to be their preacher? How shall they believe except someone except they hear? And how shall they hear except someone preach to them? They've got to hear it. And you may be the one they hear it through. Really hear it through. You've got to pray. But this is what he said, first of all, Pray for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. This is the reason we pray. Because God wants them saved. And if we don't pray, they miss their opportunity. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So, what's the situation the lost are in? Children of the devil, under the Satan's authority, energized by the devil, in the strong man's house, bound by that strong man, in Satan's prison, lying prostrate, doing obeisance to the devil, in abject submission, blinded by the devil, and finally, generally, the lost have a universal incapacity to comprehend salvation. Now, salvation is very simple. Isaiah alludes to the idea that a wayfaring fool couldn't err in the way of salvation, yet thousands and millions miss heaven. Thousands and millions miss the simple gospel message. Thousands and millions don't comprehend why we come to church, why we love Jesus, why we worship, why we praise Him, why we're so grateful. They don't, you are an enigma to them. You are a mystery to them. Why? Because God, uh, the God of this world has blinded them the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14 concerning the natural man. Look at this verse. 1 Corinthians 2 and 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. The natural fleshly man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. That word uh, 
foolishness. They are foolishness unto him or unto them. That word is where we get our word for moron. It is the highest class of mental deficiency, Webster's tell us. Moron is. The highest class of mental deficiency, it's above imbecile or idiot. This is how God's describing the lost, folks. This is what uh, this is. This is why God's mercy is on the world. God uh, God looks on them with compassion and with mercy. This is why uh, uh, Jonah was sent to Nineveh. How did, how did they describe that city? They described this. Now they were, you know, you know th th this is a spiritual principle. But this was a whole city that couldn't tell their right hand from their left. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? An entire city given over to idiocy. Given over to foolishness. Given over to imbecility and Jonah went in there to preach the gospel to them listen folks just because they were morons imbeciles and idiots didn't mean they wouldn't split hell wide open I want you to think about that for a moment you know we look at the heathen and we look at the uh, uh, you know we look at those that may not have it all together and we look at those that well they didn't have an opportunity listen God says they need a preacher. God says they need to turn from darkness to light. They need to come out from under the authority of the devil. They need to come out of the devil's family. The light has to come on. The blinders have to come off. Because if they don't, they're going to hell. That's why we've got to pray for the lost. And this is a situation we find ourselves in. There's no one out there, no one else that's going to pray for them. This is God's number one job. This is God's number one priority. The lost find themselves in a situation and condition where they are bound by the devil. Prisoners of the devil. Lying prostrate before the devil. We've got to be aware of this situation, folks. Because uh, if we don't understand the true condition and true situation of the lost, uh, nothing will ever be done about them. People are hoping that, uh, well, somehow they'll be saved. Somehow some, something will happen in the end where they'll be saved. Until they respond to the gospel, they won't be saved. We've got to pray. Amen. This is why we must pray. This is why we've got to care. This is why we've got to be concerned. This is why we can make a difference. Are you listening to me? In the family of Satan. In the family of the devil. Jesus came. He said in Luke 19 and verse 10, He came to seek and to save that which is lost. This is His purpose. And this ought to be our purpose. This is his desire. You know, people are concerned about making disciples. And certainly discipleship is important. We've got to grow people up in Jesus. <laughs> and that's wonderful when we do. Uh, but there are no disciples without getting them saved first. There are no disciples without getting them out of the devil's kingdom. There are no disciples without getting them out from under his authority, out of his family, out of his prison house, off their face from doing obeisance to him, to him and set free so that they can hear the gospel. It's time for you to pray. It's time for me to pray. We need to pray for the lost. I don't know what it is, about praying, but when you begin to focus in on prayer, things begin to happen. George Muller prayed for five fr friends over a period of 60 years. 
One got saved after a year, another got saved after five years, another got saved after 11 years. He continued to pray daily, consistently, every day. No matter what else was done, he prayed for these friends that weren't saved. Finally, after his death, the last fellow that didn't get saved got saved at his funeral. Your prayers make a difference, church. Your prayers make an opportunity for that fellow in a prison house to go free. And unless you pray, the job doesn't get done. Why we must pray for the lost. Hallelujah. This is our position. You and I are called as intercessors. No one else is called to this position. The Bible tells us this in 1 Peter 2 and verse 5, that we are lively stones and build up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We are called to offer up spiritual sacrifices. We are called as a holy priesthood. What is a priest? A priest is someone who represents God to the people and represents the people to God. And you and I, when it talks about, when Paul talks about prayer in, in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says supplications and prayers and giving of thanks and specifically intercessions. Intercessions. Intercession specifically has to do with praying for the lost. Praying for the lost. Not everybody moves into that aspect of prayer, but he calls every one of us to intercede. He calls every one of us to stand the gap. He calls every one of us to bridge this gap between the lost and God. They cannot find their way unless someone bridges the gap. Unless someone offers up the sacrifices of a spiritual priesthood, and we're going to see what those sacrifices are through the next couple of nights. But uh, primarily I wanted us to see the importance and the necessity of prayer. Why we have to pray. We have to pray because they're bound. We have to pray because they're in prison. Now tomorrow night we're going to get into how to pray for them. And what's involved when we pray. But, uh, but we have got to understand that unless you pray, they're not going free. You are the one who is free. You are the one who's saved. You are the one who's out from under the devil's power. You have the authority. You have the right to pray for them. So we need to begin to do that. You know, uh, each night I want to do this. I want you to mention someone that... Uh, you know needs to be saved, and uh, we're going to pray for them, all right? Now, this is a small group. Now, usually we'll have uh, just you stand where you are and mention the person, but I I'm, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do tonight is uh, we're going to take uh, each one of you, and uh, we're just going to take some time and pray for each person in the, in the Spirit. And we're going to pray. Uh, we're going to pray for them, and uh, pray that uh, uh, laborers be sent across your path. We're going to pray that uh, the uh, word gets sent to them and has free course. It's unhindered in their life. We're going to pray that uh, the word's glorified to them. But we're going to pray for the ones that are on your heart, because I want you to think about this for a moment. You may be the only one in that person's life who's ever prayed for them to be saved. You may be the only one. I'm telling you, you may be the only one. So we want to pray. I, I, I want you, if you would, we'll begin with uh, a young lady, uh, um, that I'd like you to pray for, pray with me and agree with me for her salvation. That is uh, 
uh, Madison Sim Simkins. She's just graduated from high school, and she's a very confused young lady. And uh, I want you to agree with me for her salvation. I want you to agree that the blinds be taken off her eyes. I want you to uh, pray that she be blessed and sanctified and that the word be sent to her. So let's go ahead and stand to our feet. And we're going to take a few moments and just pray for, uh, for Madison. All right? Father, we lift up Madison to you right now in the name of Jesus. We pray for her salvation. We pray for her deliverance. Together we agree, Father God, that she's no longer bound by Satan. She's no longer blinded, but she can see clearly. Father God, open her eyes in the name of Jesus. I ask that you'd bless her. You say the goodness of God leadeth men and women to repentance. Father God, let your goodness be known to her. Father God, sanctify her and separate her for salvation. And Father God, we pray in the Spirit right now for Madison Simpkins. Oh, Just lift up your voice. Pray out boldly. Bon de la maracende di acota la machon de la machentio. Brante se branto se combra machante di acchiato. Brante se chionto son per la machante di acchiato. Oh, Father, save her. Lord, you came to seek and save that which is lost. Father God, put her in a position, Father God, where she's separated unto you for salvation. We break the bondage of the devil over her life. We call her out of darkness into the kingdom of your dear son. We call her saved in Jesus' name. We agree together for her salvation tonight. There's something about prayer when we agree together. There's something about corporate prayer when we agree for, for prayer. And I'm telling you, especially the lost, God is interested in seeing the lost saved. God is involved in getting the lost saved. He's going to do whatever it takes to get the lost saved. And when we pray together, when we pray corporately, our prayers are multiplied, the power is multiplied, and the prayer is much stronger. Amen. Now, it's strong when we pray by ourselves. I'm not saying it's not, but there's a power in corporate prayer when we pray. Uh, sister, is there someone you want to mention that we can pray for tonight? Your sister Doris? Father, we lift up Doris to you right now in Jesus' name. And Father God, we call her into the kingdom of God. We break the bondages of the devil over her life. And we call her saved tonight in Jesus' name. Satan, loose your hold upon Doris in the name of Jesus. Send laborers across Doris' path that they might speak and preach the word to her. And Father God, uh, open her eyes so that she might see clearly her lost condition and see clearly the plan of salvation to receive you. Father God, uh, let her see what she must see and let her know what she must know. Father God, let her cry out, what must I do to be saved? We lift up Doris to you right now in Jesus' name. We lift her up to you in the Spirit, Father God, pray. Uh, Lord, whatever is necessary, pr prepare her for salvation. Position her for salvation in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Sister, do you have someone we can pray for? Your husband? What's his name? Gary. Gary. Okay. Lord, we pray for Gary, our sister's husband. Lord, we pray that the bondage be broken off his life, that he break out of prison right now in Jesus' name. Lord, that the light come on, Father God, that he sees his lost condition in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we call him out of darkness in Jesus' name. 
In Jesus' name, we send laborers across his path. We call the blinders to be off his eyes now in Jesus' name. We pray for Gary. We lift him up by name, Father, in Jesus' name. Do what's necessary to see Gary saved in the name of Jesus. We call Gary out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your dear son. We call him delivered. We call him set free in Jesus' name. Lord, send labors across his path. Let the word be unhindered in his life in Jesus' name. Brata Shakia Tototo. Hanamashata. Sister. Julie. Father, we lift up our sister's daughter to you in Jesus' name. We break the bondage of the devil over her life. We call her out of darkness into the kingdom of your dear son. We call her saved and delivered in Jesus' name. Do what's necessary to see her saved. Angels, go forth and prepare her. Prepare laborers to come across her path in Jesus' name. Julie, we lift up Julie to you in Jesus' name. Yambare mashimbare akobre mashendere atiara. Rama shokota, sanctify her, separate her, call her out for salvation in Jesus' name. Rama shombrasere atombra basheki atianto. Rama shokombra bashandere akiato raboshondere atianto. Rama shoprono shambra bashombra bashepi atara bashatia. Rata shokosa rabashoso. Sheke. Sister, who can we pray for? Okay. And his name is Holman? Coleman. Coleman. Father, in Jesus' name, you foul devil that's lied to this young man, we break your hold off uh, on his life in the name of Jesus. We break the bondage off of his life in the name of Jesus. We call Coleman saved in Jesus' name. We call him delivered in Jesus' name. Satan, take your hands off him in Jesus' name. We break the authority. We break the power of the devil off of Coleman's life in Jesus' name. Father, send laborers across his path. Open up his blind eyes. Father God, let him know what he must do to be saved. Send the word to him, Father, in Jesus' name. We pray for Coleman in Jesus' name for salvation. We pray, Father God, for his deliverance. We pray, Father, in Jesus' name that he would be set free. In Jesus' mighty name. We pray that people would speak boldly to Coleman in Jesus' name, the word of God. Thank you, Father, that they would have wisdom to speak the right words that he might be saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Father. Brother, how can we pray? Who shall we pray for? Leroy. Crownheart. Hardheart. Oh, there's a name. Hardheart. Well, Father, he'll not be hard-hearted any longer. Lord, that he'll be soft-hearted, that he'll be open to receive the gospel. Father God, that his heart would be softened. Father God, that you'll penetrate his hard heart, Father, in Jesus' name, that he might be saved. Send laborers across his path. We pray the blinds off his eyes. We pray him out of prison. We pray him out of bondage. We pray him out from under the devil's authority. In Jesus' name, we pray for Leroy to be saved in Jesus' name tonight. We pray for him to be delivered tonight in Jesus' name. We pray, Father God, for him to be set free tonight in Jesus' name. We pray for Leroy's salvation, Father, in Jesus' name. Send the word to him. Send laborers to him. Let the word be unhindered and let the word be glorified in his life. Let it be multiplied to him, Father, in Jesus' name. We pray for Leroy right now in Jesus' name. Father, 
Father, we pray for Leroy right now together corporately. And we agree for his salvation. We agree for his deliverance. We agree that he'll be set free in Jesus' name. Brother Doris. Okay, Father, we pray for Doris. Again, we pray her out from under the devil's authority. We pray that the lights come on. We pray, Father God, that laborers be sent across her path, that the word come to her and be unhindered in Jesus' name. We pray for her salvation. We pray for Doris, Father, in Jesus' name. Kenama, send the word to her and glorify the word in her life. That she would come out from under the bondage of the devil. That she would come out of the prison house. We call her out in the name of Jesus. We call her saved in Jesus' name. Lord, position her for salvation. Put her in a place where she can be saved in Jesus' name. We pray in the Spirit for Doris. Brasso, 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 brianticia, brasso, condasha, chiatiatoso. Thank you, Father, for salvation. We pray for Travis right now, Father, in Jesus' name. We call him saved. We call him delivered. We call him set free in Jesus' name. We agree together, Father, for Travis. Lord, we pray, Father God, in Jesus' name, that his eyes be open. We pray, Father God, that the word would go to him unhindered that the word would be sent to him unhindered to save him and deliver him. We pray, Father God, that the word would be glorified in his life. We pray that he'd come out from under obeisance to the devil and out from under the bondage of the devil. We pray, Father God, that he'd be set free. We call him and declare Travis to be set free tonight in Jesus' name. Aaron? Karen. Karen Flasher. Father in Jesus' name. Karen Flasher's salvation. We pray for her right now, Father in Jesus' name. We pray for her deliverance. We pray for her to be set free. We pray for her to come out from under bondage. We pray that the word be sent to her in Jesus' name. We pray, Father God, that she come out from under that blindness, out from under that foolishness, out from under that imbecility. Father God, that she can see clearly her lost condition, that she can see clearly her need for a Savior and salvation. Father, in Jesus' name, we send the word to her in Jesus' name to be saved. We pray for Karen and thank you, Father, for her salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Victoria? Okay. Victoria, Father God, we lift her up in Jesus' name. We pray for her salvation. We pray for her deliverance. We pray that her eyes be open. We pray that the bondage of the devil be broken over her life right now. We call her out of darkness into the kingdom of your dear son. We call her saved. We call her set free. We call her delivered in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray for Victoria. We pray, Father God, that she would have true victory in her life that she would be truly and genuinely saved. Send laborers to her, Father, that would speak the word to her. Let the word be unhindered in her life. Let the word be glorified in her life. Let those who speak to her speak boldly in Jesus' name. Send the word to her. We call her saved. We call her delivered. We call her set free. We call her out of the prison house in Jesus' mighty name. Shombria, probria, chombria, cobria, dashia, Rama Shokomba Rabashente Riakota Rabashoso, Shoka Rabashoso Rabashoso, Rama Shokota Rabachetea. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You fellows have someone you want prayed for? John Rose. Father, in Jesus' name, we lift up John to you right now. We call him saved. We call him delivered. We call him set free. Send the word. Send the word to him. Let the word be unhindered in his life. 
Send laborers across his path. Let the word be glorified to him in Jesus' name. Let it be multiplied to him in Jesus' name. Father God, open the eyes of his blindness, Father God, that he might see and believe. Father God, uh, take away his foolishness and take away his misunderstanding, Father God, that he can see clearly the plan of salvation, Father God, and see clearly his lost condition, Father. In the name of Jesus, send laborers across his path. In the name of Jesus, we break the bondage of the devil over his life. In Jesus' name, we, we take authority over the strong man. We bind the strong man in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Father God, for his salvation. Korama, Yama, Yono, Namashani, Akeni, Amoni, Amoni, Akalemeni, Atu, Yokoro, Mashandio. Namana Kocha, Namacheni. Namana Kono, Manacheni. Deshe Kieto. Mark? Mark. Father God, we lift up Mark to you. Lord, you know him. We don't know him, but Lord, our brother knows him. And Father God, we ask, Father that you would send your word to heal him and deliver him. Send your word to save him. Send your word to set him free in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus. Pray for his salvation. Pray for his deliverance. Pray that he'd be set free from the devil's bondage in Jesus' name out from under the devil's hold, out from under the devil's authority, out from under the devil's family. In the name of Jesus, be free, Mark. We declare you free. We send the word to deliver you and set you free and to save you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, one more time, I want you to mention the names as we go. I'm going to speak of mine first, and then as I point to you, to shout it out. The rest of you just keep praying, all right? Well, Lord, we lift up each one of these names again to you, Father. We lift these up in Jesus' name for salvation, for deliverance, that they be out from under the devil's authority, out from under the devil's family, out from under this bondage and blindness in the name of Jesus, out from under this prostrate obeisance in Jesus' name. We pray for each one that has been mentioned tonight. We pray for their salvation. I pray for Madison, called Abasha Rabasha. For Doris, called Abasha. For Aaron, Tashanta. For Julie. For Coleman. For Leroy. For Doris. For Travis. For Karen. For Victoria. For John. For Mark. We pray for each one, Father, in Jesus' name. And we thank you for their salvation. We thank you for their deliverance. We thank you that they're set free in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now listen, folks. You take that name. This is the first night of you praying for them. You may have prayed before, but don't let a day go by without praying for them. And you're going to see some mighty things take place. You're going to see some powerful things take place. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we bless these people. We thank you, Father God, for this service. We thank you, Father God, for a heart for the lost. Lord, that they might be saved, Father God. Just stir in us a heart for the lost. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Tomorrow night, how we can pray for the lost.